Good afternoon, everyone. Um, let's get started, maybe. Uh, the clock started, so, you know, that's my sign, I suppose. I'm uh, super happy to be here. Um, uh, glad to be able to talk about aviation and sustainable aviation fuel a little. Um, and I hope that, uh, you know, you can get some insights uh, today uh, from, from the session. My name is Alexander Cooper. I lead the aviation, renewable aviation business in Neste. And since you, many of you probably don't know, Neste is not Nestle. So we don't do chocolates. We, we are an energy company and we, uh, we produce uh, sustainable fuels. So I want to go a bit into, into the, the, the background of um, you know, what we're doing, what the solutions are that we're offering to help you and your company, companies decarbonize. So now I'll see if that works. Oh, here we go. All right. Um, so you all know, now I'm telling you what you already know probably, that, uh, that uh, in COP28 we all made the commitment that we want to go uh, carbon-free, that we want to reach net zero. Um, and I think probably most of us or all of us would agree with that. Now the problem is more how do we get there? Um, and that, of course, is, is the bigger challenge. So for me, it is not so much about talking about where we want to be and in, in, in 2050. It's more about what are the waypoints that we have on the way and also what kind of specific actions can we take and what are the solutions that are available to help decarbonize. And also, of course, what does it mean for your business? So I'm assuming most of you are not here in a private capacity. It's more you're representing companies, probably. So what can your company do? How can you contribute? Um, and of course, also especially related to uh, when it comes to your travel, to your corporate travel, but also for your tri private travel, of course, for that matter. Now, um, I'm not telling you anything new. There's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of external pressure, there's NGOs, there's, uh, there is uh, governments, there is the public opinion. And uh, we, we are facing quite a bit of a change in, in, in paradigm, in, 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 kind of in the thinking that, uh, that the public has. And of course, that needs to be addressed. Now, that of course is, is nothing new for you. The question is more, what can we do about it? Now, 30% of the world's most influential companies um, have verified emissions, emission reduction targets, and, and that means that 70% don't. Um, and of course, when it comes to corporate travel, only 40% uh, say they're working to optimize their corporate travel. It's just one of the many things that you can do to reduce your carbon footprint. And for instance, in Neste, when we travel, uh, we basically deliver sustainable aviation fuel in the quantity that it would basically offset the carbon footprint that we have when we travel. So that is perfectly well doable. Now again, it is a little confusing because the, because the, the, the public and also the companies get confused by a lot of complexity. And that complexity sometimes doesn't help because it confuses people. People are, you know, we, we I'll come to that in a moment. 80% of people have lost belief in sustainability statements. And that is uh, a number that is worrying. Uh, you know, how can we regain trust and make it more credible? And I think it's, it's less about, uh, you know, that we say, yes, we want to be net zero in 2050, which of course is a still uh, a very valid goal to have, but it's more about explaining people, how do we get there? Now, let me tell you a bit about, uh, about Neste. Neste is a, a Finnish company that was founded after World War II. Basically, the purpose of the company was to um, provide the Finnish market with refined products, you know, heating oil, gasoline, and, and so on, everything that you needed as a country. Um, they were refining crude oil that was pretty difficult. The expert call it heavy and sour, which means there's a lot of sulfur in it. So they were kind of specializing and, and becoming more better and better in, in, in processing difficult feedstock, in this case, fossil feedstock. And over the decades, they developed a 
capability in, in, in dealing with these difficult feedstocks. And then suddenly they thought, maybe we can also deal with non-fossil feedstocks. And this is all how it all came about. In the mid-90s, they patented a certain uh, process, which is called NextBTL. That's what we still use today in our refineries. And that is basically how can we convert uh, waste into fuel. And, and in this case, in the case of sustainable aviation fuel, it would be uh, used cooking oil, for example. How can you use used cooking oil, which is a product that maybe 20 years ago people would have chucked down the toilet or in the sink, and it's just a, a waste product. And today it is a very, very sought after and useful product, which is actually made to do jet fuel. Um, so they developed this, uh, this technology. And now comes the fascinating bit, which always fascinates me when I hear about, you know, the early 2000s, there was some visionary people uh, that thought, okay, let's go into this. And it wasn't mainstream then. In the early 2000s, that was after 9-11, and there was, a, you know, the financial crisis, and people were thinking about other stuff, really. Um, and these people knew that this would become a necessity and also there would be a market for it. And they invested heavily in it. They invested heavily in producing sustainable fuels. I think that was an incredibly courageous decision to take because the way to make more money would have been to stay in fossil. Um, this, and and if, you, if, you, if, you look at the, if you were to look at the financial statements of, of Neste in the, in the 2000s, you can see actually the profit goes down quite a lot because they, they put an awful lot of money into this and they never knew whether it would actually fly and work on an industrial scale. Um, but they had the courage to do it, they had the courage to do, see it through. Now, I myself am not Finnish, but what strikes me about my colleagues who are Finnish, most of them are, um, is that they are very close to nature. So most of them have some sort of little house at the lake where they go in the summer. They're very connected to nature, so they kind of feel a very strong bond to say we need to protect that nature. And I think that's part of the driver that people had. Let's do the right thing here. Um, now, of course, now we're 20 years later, we are the leading producer in, in sustainable fuels, both in renewable diesel, but also in sustainable aviation fuel. Um, and now basically we reap the benefits of those decisions, those courageous decisions that were made a long time ago. Now, uh, what does it all mean for you? And, and, and sort of, yeah, we're here now at Neste, so and you've now heard that we have sustainable aviation fuel and why. Um, but of course, now, how do we, how we translate, do we translate it into specific actions? Um, now, there's a lot of pressure. I'm not telling you anything new about uh, how to make an impact. Uh, there is, you know, a frustrating amount of data and conflicting statements about how do you decarbonize. Uh, there is, of course, also greenwashing. Um, and there is a lot of pointing fingers at business travel. So for some reason, aviation gets a lot of attention. Um, now, my, my son, when he was a couple of years ago, he was like, I don't know, 15, and, and he went to this Fridays for Future, um, uh, you know, uh, meetings. And I, I asked him, so ask your friends what the percentage of aviation is in the global carbon footprint. And most of his friends were around 50%. So 50% of the global carbon footprint is aviation, is what they thought. Well, actually, it's about between 2 and 3%. Um, now, does it mean we can lean back and say, hey, aviation is just 2% or 25 maybe, you know, we, we don't need to do much. Other people need to do a lot more to decarbonize. Well, that is not true, of course. Uh, it means that if we don't decarbonize, we will soon be at probably 10 or 20% because other industries have it easier to decarbonize. So if you run a fleet of trucks, it's a lot easier for you to decarbonize than if you fly an airplane because the simply electricity, for example, as a means of propulsion and energy source is not available for larger planes and long haul. Uh, now, I don't need to tell you about the benefits of, of, of aviation. I think probably most people in this room have uh, sat on a plane in their life. Anybody hasn't and has the, the, the courage to stand up? Uh, so most, most of us have, have been in planes, of course. Um, but it's, it's important to remember that 80% of the world's population have never seen a plane from the inside. There's a huge growth potential. And of course, that also means, unfortunately, there's a huge potential for increasing the footprint of aviation. Um, 
Now, let me talk a bit about what we're going to do about it as an industry. Now, um, decarbonizing aviation is a huge task. Some of it we will be able to do by using technology. Uh, technology means that a newer generation of the A320, for example, uh, has a 20% lower CO2 emission and fuel burn than the first generation A320. Um, and then there's winglets, and then there is also electric and, and hybrid aircraft. So there's a bit we can do. You can see it in the blue, the dark blue kind of um, uh, corner there. It, it, it won't be the biggest thing we can do. Then there's operations and infrastructure, which basically means that if you uh, have more, uh, a more efficient air traffic management system, you can also cut emissions quite significantly. Um, I think if there were a single European sky that were really efficient, that would cut the European CO2 emissions in aviation by 10%. That is a lot. Um, but of course, it's not, you know, when you fly somewhere in Europe, you always go around different kind of airspaces and whatnot. The sharpest knife in the box is sustainable aviation fuel. And you can see it here. So uh, in 2021, we had about 100,000 tons of sustainable aviation fuel. We, by 2050, we will need 360 million tons of sustainable aviation fuel. The ramp up is just, is just uh, you know, magnificent that has to happen. And... Um, we are now, of course, doing that. There's a lot of investment that is required. But basically, 65% of the decarbonization is going to come from sustainable aviation fuel. And that will require those 360 million tons. Now, I think next year we might be somewhere around 3 and 5 million tons. So, you know, there's still way to go. But also, there has been a good ramp up uh, in, in the last sort of couple of years. Uh, it requires a lot of investment. One of these refineries that you have to, we have three of them or four. Uh, one of these refineries costs about between one and two billion US dollars. It's a lot of money you have to put on the table. And that, by the way, requires some regulatory kind of framework, some, some, some demand certainty, such as incentives or mandates, uh, where you would know that if you invest two billion euros, you would also be able to sell the product later on, because otherwise nobody's going to invest in this. Now, uh, we've transformed this, and now we have the SAF. Uh, we, we are ramping it up big time. We are having, you know, millions of tons of SAF, and now we need to do something with it. Some of the airlines go and buy it, but also there's a chance for businesses to actually buy it and reduce their carbon footprint when they fly or their, their uh, employees fly around. Um, right, so something is wrong here. Anyway, I'll just to explain how it works. So basically you set your target. You say, okay, this is how much we fly. It's pretty easy. Usually you would have a, you know, a travel agency or a, a, like, a, like a travel provider, and they will tell you, okay, this is all the flights that you take. There's, you, know, you can look on the IATA website, you can, you can look at uh, you know, how much CO2 footprint from a flight from A to B and which class you travel, then it's gonna give you exactly the number. So you do know if you wanted to offset or if you wanted to address all your CO2 emissions, you would know how much stuff you would need to buy. Um, we then deliver the stuff. Of course, we won't deliver it to you uh, because what do you do with that when we put you the, you know, the little kind of tank in front of your door of your office, you do nothing with it. We deliver it to our partner airlines and they burn it. They burn it, but they cannot claim the certificates and the benefits because the benefits are for the ones that are paying for it. And that would be you in that case. So if you pay for it, you get the benefits, you get the certificates. You can then introduce it into your ESG and sustainability reporting and say, you know, we have credible proof that, and okay, that's the slide that was missing. Anyway, so we have, um, we have, uh, certain certifications, certain bodies like SPTI, ISCC, that certify this. There's a, there's, a, there's a third party that independently warrants and certifies that that CO2 reduction has actually happened. Now, um, how many of you have already flown on sustainable aviation fuel? No idea. Well, well, actually, I can tell you it's, it's most of you. If, if you've ever flown out of Heathrow or Amsterdam, you would have had some sustainable aviation fuel in the tank of the aircraft you were flying on because it's in the hydrogen system. It's a little part of it, but it's in the hydrogen system. 
But of course, the airline that pays for it or the customer that pays for it gets to claim the benefit for it. So sustainable aviation fuel, maybe just to round that up, is basically a fuel that you can use. You can just put in the tank of any aircraft. You don't need to modify the engine. You don't need to modify the aircraft. You don't need to modify the tank. We call it a drop-in solution, which basically means that you just put the stuff, you mix it with fossil fuel. 50-50 is the maximum you can do for certain chemical reasons that probably I wouldn't be able to explain in the remaining five minutes. Um, so you have 50% of SAF, you have 50% of fossil fuel, and then what you do, you just mix it together, you put it in the hydrant system of London Heathrow, Amsterdam, or whichever airport you want to put it in. And then it gets basically on every aircraft that is in there because it basically when you, I don't know if you've seen it, when you fly, you have these you know, holes in the ground and then you connect the hose and that's how the fuel gets to the aircraft. So you have a, a little bit of that in every aircraft. Um, it is made of used cooking oil, mostly. There's also animal fat and other sources. And there's uh, forestry waste. In the future, there will be things called e-fuels. You might have heard of it. So that's basically a lot of electricity, CO2, and water. And you can convert even that into sustainable aviation fuel. Today, most of it is, is the source is used cooking oil, which if we wouldn't use it for that, the used cooking oil would basically go to waste. It would basically land somewhere in the sewage. The sustainable aviation fuels cuts the emissions over the life cycle of the product, the emissions by 80%. So that, that is where you have the true impact when you buy it, that you have an 80% reduction of the emissions that you would cause if you would fly on fossil fuel. And we're at the beginning, but I think the main and important message is, it's in your hands, you can do that. We and you know, there is stuff on the market. If you hear there's not enough, well, it is there. It's ramping up big time. And so my message to you is it is available. Um, and, and I would encourage everyone to, um, to, to use it, to, to contribute to decarbonizing uh, uh, corporate, corporate trouble. Um, I think there's, there's not one golden bullet to decarbonize aviation and the whole industry and our society as a whole. Uh, I think we're lagging behind. Uh, I, I, uh, we're not probably doing enough to, to reach net zero 2050. By the way, I would like to know, who, who of you thinks that we are on track for net zero 2050 as a, as a general kind of society and, and, a, and a, global, a global society? Anyone? Are you challenging us? Sorry? Are you challenging us? Uh, I'm saying we're not doing enough, probably, right? Um, uh, and, and I think there's not a single person in this room that thinks we're on track for net zero 2050, not just for aviation, but as a whole. And that, that, is, pretty, that is pretty sad in a way, right? Um, but I, I do think there's not the one golden bullet that we have to kind of fix it, but there's a lot of different things that we can do. And this is one of them. So my message is, let's start doing it and let's do it together. Thank you very much. Now, I'm, I'm if there's any questions, I think we have a, a, you know, a couple of minutes left. Uh, you, you made the point that the, a refinery costs 2 billion euros. What capacity would that refinery have? I'm sorry? You made the point that refinery costs 2 billion euros. How much sustainable aviation fuel could it produce in a year? What's the capacity? So, the, the, so we, we just opened a new refinery in Singapore, and the, the, the production capacity is 1.5 million tons. If, when you think that, you know, in 2021, the global, not just Neste, the global production capacity of SAF was 100,000 tons, that is a massive number and a massive ramp up. That would be about 2 billion, or would that be about 1.5 billion? Uh, I think Singapore's $1.65 billion. And that means you've got quite a big, big number to get 360 million tons per annum. It's going to be a 350 billion. It's, it's, a, it's a big number, if yes. I'm, if I'm flying London, New York, <coughs> what's the cost of the sustainable aviation fuel? If I want to buy that, what would it cost for business versus economy? <laughs> 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 I mean, 
So um, uh, I, I've got my wonderful colleagues here who can give you the exact number, but, but sort of, you know, from, from the top of my head. So, of course, what you would do is say there's maybe 250 passengers on that plane. So if you wanted your part in it, basically, you would have, I don't know, 20, 30 tons of sustainable aviation fuel. Then you divided the cost by 250. Um, there's, when you go on airlines' websites, you find different prices. But, you know, I, I dare say that probably your part, if you fly in the economy, is not going to be much more than what you would spend on a meal on Heathrow in Heathrow Airport before you before you fly. Um, it, it it is a number that is a two digit number. Clearly, I mean you know that that's not hugely expensive. Now, if you fly in business class and first class, the calculation is different because what they do is they say, okay, you could have put nine seats on that space where you put one business first class seat, and therefore the 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 number you divide. The, the whole kind of cost of the staff is 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 a lot uh, is a lot um, lower. So, uh, but but the the cost you can look it up when you fly in KLM Bridge Airways uh, Lufthansa when you when you use Nest Impact and I don't know have the in case you're interested and I'm not here as a sales guy but you know the, this is the you know please uh, do uh, uh, look at it you you can make the calculation there and and the cost is is not really that high if you think about that you need to put those used cooking oil which is quite expensive by the way these days you need to put it through a refinery that's two billion dollars or 1.6 billion dollars but of course the division that you make because there's two 150 passengers on the plane then takes the number down to a more reasonable uh, number. Great, Alexander, thank you so much. Um, we do have the next session coming in, so for any further questions, I'm sure there'll be some time to regroup afterwards. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.